Okay, last cardiology lecture. I'm sure you guys are ready to be done. So antiarrhythmic drugs um, fall into a couple different classes, and uh, you can come back to this slide if you want to look at the cardiac action potential and how things work. But basically, we're looking at sodium and potassium channels for the most part and blocking them and, and changing the, uh, the modifying the heart's ability to uh, create action potentials and therefore hopefully reset some of the electrical pathways and prevent arrhythmias from occurring. Um, phase one or phase zero here is considered our rapid depolarization. So you get some increased sodium conductance, increased potassium conduct conductance, and opening of fast sodium channels. Um, and then you have uh, a little review of cardiac, ana cardiac anatomy, which I'm not going to go through. <clears throat> and then a, a number of different phases here too, which I'm not super concerned with. We're going to talk about um, the the way that the drugs work. But when I talk about a potassium channel blocker, you can look at this and see, okay, this is where potassium is important and then how it's affecting the different phases. So if you're looking at the different phases of the cardiac action potential, and that's basically what we're talking about here. All right, anyway, let's get to the drugs. So drugs are um, class one, two, three, and four. Class one um, and three are a big antiarrhythmic. Class two and four aren't necessarily antiarrhythmics per se. So I'll talk about the, the differences here, but class one are sodium channel blockers. Um, and there's three different groups. There's class 1A, B, and C, um, and they all do slightly different things. So either they're they're usually working, A and C, for example, are slowing um, zero depolarization. Um, A is prolonging phase three repolarization. B is shortening phase three repolarization. And C doesn't really have any effect on phase three. B has very little effect on phase zero. So lots of differences there. Um, but the point is that they're all sodium channel blockers. I honestly, for my test purposes, I don't care if you know this. This is for your information only. Um, class 2 beta blockers um, are uh, technically antiarrhythmic drugs, so they decrease heart rate, uh, but we don't technically use them for that. We use them for rate control. Um, class 3 are potassium channel blockers that are primarily going to prolong phase 3 repolarization and our other major group of antiarrhythmic um, drugs. And then class four are calcium channel blockers, and by that would be the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. All right, I can get my cursor here. Um, they're going to re reduce the rate of spontaneous depolarization and basically rate control as well. Um, antiarrhythmic uses are used for atrial fib, ventricle, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. Um, and your overall risk is basically you're, you can end up prolonging your QTC interval a long time that, that ends up um, possibly interfering with other processes or getting causing an arrhythmia itself. If you give too much antiarrhythmic, you can cause an arrhythmia, which is kind of interesting. But really, we're going to talk about AFib quite a bit today during this segment. So um, class 1A antiarrhythmics, I just want to go through some of them. There's a, a bunch of drugs in this category, uh, but these aren't real common medications, so I don't want you to spend a lot of time on them. Um, and in fact, they're all contraindications that are strongly cautioned if you have heart failure MI, so it limits their use somewhat. Lidocaine and mixilidine are also not ones that I really want you to spend a lot of time on. You could have people on a lot of these drugs technically, and they pop up here and there, but um, you know, just knowing that they're class one is fine with me. Um, propafenone and flecainide are probably two of the more common ones, the class 1C. Um, flecainide being maybe probably the most common class one agent. It's a um, AFib conversion maintenance agent. Um, a lot of these have different indications, but um, they could be used for either or. And by AFib conversion, what I mean when I say that is that you can give a large dose of these to get somebody out of AFib acutely if you wanted to. Um, that's what this pill in the pocket means. So, like, if you have somebody on flecainide, they might be on flecainide once daily, but maybe they go into AFib every once in a while. You can give them a high-dose flecainide that they carry around with them, and they take that once and that can possibly convert them out. It's got about a 50% efficacy rate, but yeah, that's not too bad for a drug that has not a whole lot of side effects associated with it. Um, so class one antiarrhythmics just aren't probably the most commonly used ones anymore. You'll see them scattered out 
and if you work in cardiology you might see them more often but for the most part we just don't use them that much so I'm kind of blowing through them for for that purpose because they really aren't a big portion of what i want you guys to know class three has really two major drugs in it that that are the big lion's share of what we use for antiarrhythmics the first is amiodarone um, which is a useful drug for a number of reasons. We can convert people out of AFib with it. We can give it for maintenance therapy. Um, it's got a huge role in pulseless ventricular tachycardia or VFib. So we use it for cardiac arrest situations as a high dose bolus. Um, and it interestingly enough has class activity in all of them. It's primarily a class three and that's where its antiarrhythmic component comes from. But it also has sodium channel, beta blocking and calcium channel blocking activities are like, how do you give this to somebody without killing them? <laughs> it's blocking like everything. And actually um, it, it can, but if you dose it correctly, uh, it, it's actually pretty effective antiarrhythmic and it's a very um, well used drug. Now, amiodarone has a lot of side effects with it. Um, a lot of amio side effects come from chronic use though. So over time, a lot of people will get pulmonary, well, not a lot, but you know, three to 15% of people, depending on what study you read, will end up with pulmonary fibrosis, which can be a really substantial condition that can cause uh, your lungs to basically not work anymore. Um, hypothyroidism is quite common with this medication. Um, hyperthyroidism is rare. It's got an iodine moiety to the structure, which interacts with different receptors in the thyroid gland and can cause thyroid damage. Um, neurologic toxicity over time is really common. Um, so people can end up with a variety of neurologic related symptoms, whether it's altered mental status or confusion. It can affect the eyes, it can affect the liver, it can cause people's skin to look blue gray, um, and it can cause, of course, cardiovascular effects. It's gonna prolong your QTC interval. So any dr other drugs that we talk about this year that I'm like, oh, that might prolong QTC. Well, if you're on amiodarone, you always want to double check anything you're adding on. Make sure it's not contributing to additional QTC prolongation. Amiodarone has a ton of drug interactions. Um, it's a moderate inhibitor of several common enzymes, and it's going to interfere with warfarin substantially. So this is one of the big ones to remember with warfarin. Because so many people take warfarin for AFib um, as an anticoagulant to prevent clots, uh, and so many people take amiodarone for AFib as well. So between the two of these, you end up with uh, sort of a, a something we have to work around. So um, the other complicating factor is that amiodarone has a 58-day half-life, and that's day. That's not a typo. It's not an hour. That's days. So if you've had somebody on amiodarone for two years and you want to switch them because, you know, you're afraid of their thyroid or, you know, they're getting too many side effects or whatever it might be, um, or they're interacting too much with their warfarin, you want to get rid of it. Um, you have to wait probably 90 days till that medication's out of the system enough where it's not affecting them anymore, which is really problematic if you're trying to prevent QTC prolongation. Because you stop somebody's amiodarone one day, you start them on a different antiarrhythmic the next day, you could really have some nasty side effects because you're basically doubling their antiarrhythmic load. You gotta let that amiodarone taper down. Um, dosing is once daily though. So interestingly enough, even though it's a 58 day half-life, we still dose it once daily because that's the convenient way. You can load amiodarone um, to overcome this this half-life so long that if you gave somebody a standard oral dose over over you know weeks it'd take forever to get them up to a steady state so what we do is we load them we give them a big iv loading dose um, and we load about 10 grams of the amiodarone over five to seven days and then you would do anywhere from 200 to 400 milligrams a day for maintenance therapy is pretty common this is a, a highly effective antiarrhythmic. Um, despite its side effects and drug interactions and stuff, it does work quite well. Um, it doesn't increase mortality and heart failure either. So patients who have an arrhythmia and heart failure, um, this is a medication that would work well for them. Class 3 continued. So our second drug, uh, our other big drug is dofetilide or ticosin. Um, dofetilide is uh, useful for both conversion and maintenance of AFib. Um, it uh, does prolong QTC interval, and if you do that too much, you can get a syndrome called torsade de point, which is a French word for twisting of the points, which is sort of like a, it's called a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia um, on an EKG. And you guys have probably talked about torsades, I, I think, but anyway, it can, it, that's, that's the risk if you prolong QTC too much as you put somebody into torsades, and that can be a, a life-threatening arrhythmia, cardiac arrest situation. 
Um, contraindications, if your QTC is really prolonged at baseline, it's also renally eliminated, so people with diminished renal function can't take this. Amiodarone, they can. Um, PO only, um, but we do hospitalize people during the administration phase, and we monitor their QTC. So um, we make sure their QTC interval, um, every, or we monitor their QTC every two, two to three hours after the first five doses. Um, or two to three hours after the first five doses, like, like I said. And then um, if their QTC increases by more than 15%, we cut their dose in half. If the QTC gets above 500 milliseconds, normal mil QTC is like 400-ish, low 400s. So if we get above 500, we stop therapy altogether. It does not increase mortality in heart failure, similar to amiodarone. You can use this in heart failure patients. It's CYP3A4 metabolized, so there are drug interactions to consider. And there's a drug that's similar to this called ibutylide or covert, which is an IV version that can convert people out of atrial fibrillation. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, another drug that's actually relatively common too is sotalol. Sotalol is a beta blocker, as you might gather from its name, but it also has class 3 potassium channel blocking properties. It's... Um, contraindicated uh, similarly to um, what's got some QTC prolongation issues very similar to uh, dofetilide. It's PO only and we also hospital monitor during administration. So it's very similar to dofetilide how we do it. Um, this would not be a medication we use for heart failure. It can cause heart failure as a side effect. So whereas we can use amio and uh, dofetilide, we don't use sotalol for heart failure. Um, can't even say this. Dronadarone, which is uh, was a drug that came out a little bit ago. It's a brand name one. It's the newer antiarrhythmic. Um, originally, it was designed as let's make a similar drug to amiodarone, but one that doesn't have the side effects. Well, unfortunately, this drug just doesn't work as well as amiodarone, and it has several side effects of its own. So it hasn't really taken off, and I don't think very many people are using it. But I put it here just as an example. It has a lot of drug interactions, short half life, um, similar QTC. Prolongation contraindications to the other drugs we talked about as well. Other drugs you might consider antiarrhythmic. Magnesium can be given in uh, high doses for torsades, so that's one of the ways we can convert people out of it. Um, adenosine is a drug that we can give to convert people out of supraventricular tachycardia, so we can give six milligram fast push. We're going to talk about this more when we talk about emergency medicine next summer, but I'll just talk about it now since these are technically antiarrhythmic drugs. I don't care you know this for the test, though. Any of the IV or super acute stuff, don't worry about it for this exam. And um, talking about atrial fibrillation. So um, AFib, so we have an irregularly irregular uh, EKG, no distinct P waves. Um, paroxysmal AFib is usually two episodes that terminate in seven days or less, usually within 24 hours, versus persistent, which does not self-terminate in seven days. So a lot of times people who start to develop AFib will develop it you know, as middle-aged adults, and there'll be paroxysmal for, for, um, for a time, and then it eventually might turn into a persistent, um, even with correct therapy and everything like that. <clears throat> So how exactly do you treat AFib? We're going to go through some of these different um, um, options we can do. So a lot of the issues with AFib come from a couple things. So first of all, there's the arrhythmia, which can cause people just to be uncomfortable, have exercise intolerance, fatigue, palpitations. Then there's thromboembolism, which can cause, which is the bigger risk. So that's blood pooling in the atria and people throwing clots and ischemic stroke rate of about 5% per year for people with AFib who are not anticoagulated. This is a pretty high risk. Um, rhythm versus rate control strategy, something you might hear about AFib, you can control people's heart rate and you can try and control their rhythm with antiarrhythmics and different patients may require different treatment strategies. Anticoagulation, um, chronic atrial fibrillation patients will require anticoagulation. We use, warfarin can be targeted, INR, or we can use the new oral options as well. Um, this is something called the CHADS-2 or CHADS-2-VASC. The CHADS-2-VASC is the newer one. It's more common, but um, CHADS-2 is a risk criteria. So there's um, a number of different things here. So C would be uh, <clears throat> heart failure, H, hypertension, A is age, D is diabetes, S is stroke, and you get two points for that if you've had a stroke. The higher the number of 
points you get, the um, increased stroke risk per year, and that stratifies you to a different anticoagulant. Um, this is chads 2 vasc which includes a couple different things, like it has gender. If you're a female, you get another point. Um, it gives you uh, two points for your age, and it adds on vascular disease as well. Oh, and then it has a, another stratification. So two points if you're over 75, one point if you're 65 to 74. Um, so basically, if you have no criteria and you have atrial fibrillation, you can just be on aspirin. That's enough. Um, if you're one, you could be on one or the other. That's fine. Um, either way is good. But if you're above two, you're going to be on warfarin or uh, oral anticoagulant. Oh. The point is, it's just... No, even if you're at slightly higher risk, if you're above 2 for your CHADS2 or CHADS2 VASC, you're going to be on um, an anticoagulant. Okay, so if we have somebody who has atrial fibrillation, it's a new onset with mild to moderate symptoms. You're usually going to start them with rate control as needed um, and using usually a beta blocker, diltiazem, verapamil work for rate control, or digoxin actually can work for rate control too in, in some of these patients. Um, and then you want to evaluate the patient for rhythm control options. So for rhythm control, patients may spontaneously cardiovert into normal sinus rhythm with rate control alone. So let's say you have somebody who comes in and they're new onset AFib and you start to rate control them with diltiazem. Um, they might convert out of the into, they might convert out of AFib into normal sinus just with that. Uh, that happens actually quite a lot. Um, Rhythm control is another strategy we can think about, and it does not necessarily have any benefits of a rate control plus anticoagulation. So the question is, with AFib, do you try and keep converting people out of it, either pharmacologically or with electricity, or do you just rate control them and give them anticoagulation? Or do you do all three? Do you rhythm control, rate control, and anticoagulate them? Um, and there's a lot of different scenarios where you could apply these, but um, basically it's gonna come down to clinical judgment and how the patient's doing and what the patient might respond to. You're looking at um, low risk for recurrent AFib, usually a one-time cardioversion, whether it's electrical or pharmacological is fine. Um, troublesome symptoms despite adequate rate control, usually requiring chronic antiarrhythmic therapy at that point. Um, and then recurrent atrial fibrillation, that might be a patient for rhythm control. So why the concern? Well, cardioversion puts patients at risk for a thromboembolic event, so we need to make sure all our bases are covered. And I'll get to this here in a second, what I mean by that. So um, looking at rhythm control long term, these are the things you could consider if, uh, if you have different comorbidities going on. So if you have no structural heart disease, um, first line might be flecainide or propafenone. Sotalol would work too. Um, second line, amiodarone or dofetilide. Uh, heart failure, amiodarone, dofetilide, ablation would be second line. Coronary artery disease, we like the beta blocker, sotalol. Unless they have heart failure, then you'd probably consider amiodarone or dofetilide. And then we have flecainide, propafenone, sotalol for hypertensive patients, uh, second-line amiodarone, dofetilide. So you can see that the drugs that we use really, we can dabble in the class 1s a little bit, but we do like our, our um, class 3s as well. Well, I've gotten the question before of what do I use? Do I use amiodarone or dofetilide if I'm going to use a class 3? Is there really one advantage over the other? It seems like dofetilide doesn't have a lot of side effects and amiodarone does. <clears throat> I had a, a pharmacist tell me this, and I like it, so I'm going to repeat it uh, a while ago when I was a student, and he said, well, if you have an old, older patient, elderly patient, amiodarone is a good drug to start them on because it's really effective, and they really aren't going to see any side effects of it for several years. So if they you know, are in their 80s or 70s, by the time they pass away, they probably aren't going to experience those long-term side effects. If you have a younger person in their 40s or 50s, amiodarone is a bad choice because by the time they get to 60, 70, 80, they aren't going to, they're, they're going to be like knees, knee deep in side effects with amiodarone. So dofetilide is probably a better option for those patients. So something to keep in the back of your mind. I think it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, determining a course of treatment for AFib. So moving from rate control to rhythm control a little bit. This is a patient who's stable. Their atrial fibrillation has been less than 48 hours. What you're going to do, so this is a person who's coming to your ER. Let's say you've, they come in, they're tachycardic. You, put, you start them on diltiazem, put them on the monitor, and they're in atrial fibrillation, and you're getting a plan in place. Well, you want to know, first of all, how long they've been in AFib for. If they've been in it less than 48 hours, 
we probably are going to use electricity to shock them out. If for some reason the patient has a contraindication to short-term anesthetics, and really for a cardioversion, you're just giving them propofol, which is a, a really mild short-term anesthetic that's an amnesic agent, um, you're probably just going to shock them. You could do pharmacologic cardioversion, so you could give them a high dose of amiodarone. You could do um, ibutilide, but generally speaking, you just shock them out of it. No anticoagulation required. If they don't shock out of it, you're probably going to have to admit them and start them on amiodarone at that point. That's a pretty common step. Or you could admit them and start them on oral dofetilide too. Um, next, rhythm control. So this is a stable patient with a direct current cardioversion option and duration unknown or greater than 48 hours. So this is, becomes a problem because the, the thought is, is that if you're, you've been in atrial fibrillation for more than 48 hours, your increased risk for, for forming a thrombus in the atria goes up substantially. So at this point, you have to assess their anticoagulation status. If they're anticoagulated, um, you're good to go. You can shock them out of it. If they aren't, um, you need to confirm if they have a clot, clot. So you can do the transesophageal echocardiogram, which is a TEE, um, and that's going to show you um, if there are any clots hiding in the atria. And if you can confirm that there aren't, you can do direct current cardioversion. If they aren't anticoagulation coagulated, what you want to do, and you can't confirm the clot, what you want to do is rate control them, and do anticoagulation three to four weeks and then bring them back in for direct current cardioversion. Remember, rate control plus anticoag has very similar outcomes to cardioversion steps, whether it's pharmacologic or electrical, same overall outcomes. Okay, so this would be a, a situation where you have a stable person and chemical cardioversion as your alternate. So when do we use pharmacologic? Well, you still want to anticoagulate the person because you're cardioverting them. So anytime you're making the atria stop fluttering, you're at risk for, is you're resynchronizing the way the heart's beating, you're at risk for throwing a clot to the brain. So if you're in atrial fibrillation for up to seven days, you can chemically cardiovert with flecainide, dofetilide, propafenone, ibutilide, or amiodarone. Any of those are fine. Um, greater than seven days, it's thought that it's just going to be more difficult to get somebody out of cardio, uh, in, out of AFib with one of the class one agents. So usually you're sticking to your class three only if they've been in AFib greater than seven days. Dofetilide, ibutilide, or amiodarone. And again, pharmacologic assumes that electrical's not going to be good. Generally speaking, electricity is always king in this situation, but certainly people don't respond to electricity. Usually people might get shocked two to three times, and if that's not working, they're probably going to go to pharmacologic at that point. Um, severe onset atrial fibrillation is really unusual, and most people are pretty stable when they come in with AFib. They might be a little uncomfortable or anxious, but they're usually fine otherwise. So what we can do in this situation is um, basically IV um, anticoagulate them as fast as we can. That's going to be with heparin. And then we might not have time to check for a clot. So in this case, these patients might be hemodynamically stable. They might be moving towards possibly a cardiac arrest type situation, which again is pretty rare for AFib, but it is possible. Um, in that case, we're going to do our best, anticoagulate them with what we got, and then we're going to um, cardiovert them electrically. Um, a flutter is a similar process to AFib, which is um, you can convert people out of it with electricity. Um, rate control is a, is useful for it. Sometimes they might use antiarrhythmic agents, not as commonly, but usually ablation is the best um, uh, best uh, um, intervention for somebody with atrial flutter. All right, that concludes cardiology. I'll see you guys Monday, and we can do a review session.